Hello, everyone. I am Xuefei Chen Song, and the Chief Editor of Green Post and China-Europe Dialogue in Stockholm. We focus more on sustainable development and climate issues. Uh, today, we shall focus on China in this area. And I feel honored to invite Mr. Eric Sulheim, uh, former United Nations Environment Program Executive Director and a Norwegian Member of Parliament, and also Minister for Environment and Foreign Aid for Development. And so he is an expert in environmental protection, climate change, and new energy and related issues in general. Welcome, Mr. Sultan. Thank you, great to be on your show. Hmm. And, and um, so since we focus on China, uh, we know that uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping has promised at the United Nations that China will achieve carbon neutral by 2060. What does it mean for the world or for our Earth? Are you confident that China really can achieve this goal? Yeah, I'm fairly confident that China can achieve this because China has achieved enormous uh, uh, um, advance in the past, because uh, in the last 40 years, China has eradicated extreme poverty. First time I came to China, there was no private cars. Every, every Chinese was very poor. Uh, they were basically eating rice, rice and noodles. Now China's uplifted in a way at a scale nowhere else in the world. And the nation can bring 1.4 billion people out of extreme poverty. Of course, it can also create an ecological civilization and it can help the world move in the green direction. Um, thank you. And China, um, China said it will reach its peak in greenhouse emission by 2030. Uh, do you think China can realize this promise? What are the challenges China has to face? First of all, China is now the leader in basically every environment-friendly technology. Some of the technologies may have been developed in California or in Germany, but when it comes to bringing these to scale and making them affordable to the world, China is uh, without any comparison the leader. Half of all solar energy in the world is now uh, developed in China. It's by far in the lead on green hydrogen, on, uh, wind power and electric mobility, 99% of all electric buses in the world uh, are running on Chinese roads. So yes, indeed, we see the speed of the transformation of happening in China, also on green issues, is unprecedented and very, very promising. So I'm confident that China can achieve uh, this peak by 2030, maybe, hopefully, even earlier. Uh, but uh, you know that... Um... Um, for example, I, I just say like uh, um, right now in uh, many ways, China and the US has a, a kind of a competitive uh, situation and uh, the US is trying to, as we understand that give pressure about China in, you know, industrial development, um, for example, you know, it's like a trade between the climate and economic development. So in what ways do you think the US is giving pressure to China? Competition in itself is not bad. I mean, if the companies in China and the United States can compete in developing the green technologies faster, it's only good. At the moment, China is well ahead in most techno green technologies. I mean, China is making 70 times more solar panels than the United States of America are. So the Americans really need to move very fast to catch up. But that business competition must be complemented by government cooperation. You should avoid any idea of Cold War, not to speak about technological decoupling. These are very dangerous ideas. 
if the two major powers of the world, United States and China, if they work together, they cooperate, under the sky's the limit, we can achieve miracles in the world. If we allow uh, tensions to build up, not to speak about violent, violence and, and wars, it will be very, very dangerous. So let's work on how we can solve these big issues for humanity together, climate change, environment destruction and pollution. Mm. Uh, China has made great efforts in dealing with climate change, um, but the uh, likely still face a lot of pressure from the West as um, uh, an ag expert in this field. Can you elaborate a bit what kind of pressure that can be, uh, especially in uh, industrial development uh, quota or market of emission? I I'm not very clear about this, but uh, for example, the emission tax or or emission uh, trading or this kind of thing. Uh, where is the competition lies like? First of all, it's completely unfair to blame China, not to speak of India for the climate crisis. Uh, US emissions up to today uh, are eight times Chinese emissions per capita and 25 times Indian emissions per capita. Even emissions in small nations like Sweden or Norway are much higher than Chinese emissions per capita. So Westerners should stop this blaming of the big uh, developing nations like India and China for the climate crisis. It's the West which has made this crisis happening. However, China of course need to address the question, not for us, but for China. Uh, India is addressing climate, not for the West, but for India because um, Asian nations are probably more vulnerable to climate change than Europe and particularly North, North America are. So we see both China and India moving very, very fast into green technologies and, and green practices, and in many areas also the best ideas. The China should also be considerate, is to understand that there is a, many European businesses feel that sometimes competition is unfair uh, that green technologies are more subsidized in China than in Europe, which is, in my view, good. We need to subsidize, subsidize them, but we need to make sure that there is equal market access. Uh, and that's beyond, uh, that's the issue behind this issue about green tariffs that European uh, companies do not want to be, uh, don't want to see a fair, fair competition. There should be a dialogue between China and Europe uh, as to how to establish the most fair basis for competition, while at the same time cooperate uh, to uh, achieve the common goals for humanity, which is to defeat climate change. Okay, so might be in this area that uh, the West always blame China for uh, unfair <laughs> competition or more government subsidies. But uh, as we know that in the early stage, at the beginning of the China's opening up, in the 40 years ago, I think China gave a lot of advantage of preferential policies to the foreign companies. And then they uh, change this and make it equal, like uh, so Chinese uh, foreign the same. So in apparently maybe the Western companies sees an increase of their tax in China, somewhat like that. I think it's completely crazy for the West to blame China for unnecessary subsidies to green industries. I mean, the big problem in the world is exactly the opposite, that there are massive subsidies for oil and gas and even coal. We should remove all subsidies for fossil fuels. That's the starting plank for how to move, move forward. However, if Western companies feel competition is unfair, for instance, that there are still uh, industries in China, which have very heavy emissions due to uh, the uh, still uh, coal still being such a major uh, major energy source in China. Uh, we should look into these issues and, and find settlement uh, to them. Uh, and but that's of course what's behind this idea about uh, European uh, green tariffs. Uh, I think we're very very hard to establish a fair uh, system for green tariffs. Uh, so the best way forward is a very very deep dialogue as to how to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. Uh, also, uh, 
What is your comment about China's green technology development, such as solar, wind power, and new energy? It's absolutely astonishing. Uh, as I said, some of the initial patents may have come in Europe or in North America, but China is the nation which brought this to scale and brought down the price so fast that, it, uh, that solar and wind and other green technologies are not affordable to everyone. Then we had the disastrous climate conference in Copenhagen in 2009. No one, not one person said that, oh, in the next 10 years, the price of solar energy will fall by 90%. And that's thanks to China and, and to India, uh, because they brought the scale of renewables to a completely, uh, completely new uh, le uh, le level. But that also cost, transformed the entire global discussion because there's no, no, no longer a, a choice to be made between development and environment. We have now all the win-win policies, which are good for the environment and good for Mother Earth and good for economy and jobs at exactly the same time. And those are the policies we should um, deploy because still there are hundreds of millions, billions of people in the world who need to develop very, very fast. Uh, but we should do that while at the same time taking much better care of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, in some sense, don't you think that uh, China has somewhat a systemic, systematic uh, advantage in realizing these goals? Um, some people think whatever the Communist Party of China say, their people will listen. But in fact, it's not that easy as you imagined. Uh, what, what do you think uh, in this aspect? China obviously has a very effective governance system. Uh, uh, it's responding also to demands from the people. Uh, my clear view is that the people of China became so tired of the enormous pollution uh, if you spoke to the middle class in all the big cities of China, they said, we don't want to live this way any longer. We want to see the sun. Uh, and then the message went to the leadership uh, of the state and the party, and they started uh, responding to that. And that's why we see now uh, environment so high on the agenda uh, in China. But to me, the most striking is that the West and China are facing exactly the same problems. Uh, we both want to reduce uh, the disparity in society. Uh, we, uh, China today try to look into how the extremely ridiculous rich it can be a little bit less rich and you can uplift everyone. Exactly the same debate we have in Europe and North America. We need to reduce um, uh, these divides in society. And we also want an economic model which is capitalist uh, but and which promotes those who are entrepreneurial and want to uh, to make changes and invest, while at the same time it's not destroying the planet, and uh, uh, and also but and, and it's also provide welfare uh, uh, for everyone in society. So at the end of the day, the main challenges are exactly the same uh, in the West and in China, and we should learn from each other in how to handle them. Mm -hmm. um... How can the Chinese people benefit from achieving these goals and how the world benefit from China's action? Maybe a little bit um, <laughs> repetitive, but uh, yeah, can you just elaborate a little bit? Yeah, what many people have not understood is that not only China is the leader on environment technologies, that, that many people understand, uh, but China is also now more and more the leader on environment practice, how to change the world in a green direction. Examples is the how tree planting in China is now by far the biggest in the world. The greening of the deserts in Inner Mongolia is the world class um, uh, way of, of, of greening a desert. The cleaning up of the waters and rivers in the Churchyang province is absolutely astonishing. Some of these rivers until very recently were called milky rivers, <laughs> not because they were healthy like milk, but because they were complete white. Now, uh, uh, every child can go bathing in these rivers and you can, you can drink from them. And of course, tourism and the life of people has improved enormously. And also some of the Chinese cities are now uh, leading the way into the green future. Uh, Hangzhou and, and, and Suzhou are very green cities, maybe particularly Shenzhen. They have great, great green corridors through the city. All buses and all taxis are electric in Shenzhen. They have even a huge wetland for birds. 
uh, right in the city center. So the West and the rest of the world has now a lot to learn from China on best environment practice. But for sure, <laughs> we can learn from each other. So also China should look into areas where uh, technologies and practice may be better in, in Europe or North America, or for that matter, in India or Africa. Uh, do you think there will be a spillover impact of China's realization of its climate goal by 2060? so that many countries can also get China's technology and products in dealing with climate change. Can you give some examples? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that when President Xi Jinping said that China will now put a full stop to all overseas coal investments, that's the most important environment decision in the world this year. Because not only it will face down coal, but it also will put the entire machinery of Chinese business behind solar and wind and green hydrogen and, 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 and electric mobility. So we see a huge surge uh, in that. And Belt and Road countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, Vietnam, or African nations, South Africa, Kenya, because if they cannot get coal investment from China, what will they do? They will start immediately demanding uh, solar and wind investments and requesting that, and China will be able to deliver. So this is a game changing decision by China. I may also mention that uh, the green infrastructure produced by China is an enormous economic help to many nations. Just last, last month, the China Laos Railroad was open. Uh, that for the first time links Laos, to not, Laos not just to, the, uh, to, to China, but to the entire European market. You can put goods on a train in Vietnam, uh, Laos, and you can send it to Düsseldorf in, in Germany or to Madrid in Spain. And of course it opens up the world for, for Laos in a completely new world. And just a month before, uh, Chinese built Metro in Hanoi, Vietnam was open. So even if there are political tensions between China and Vietnam, still China was able to construct this, uh, this um, Metro uh, in, uh, in Hanoi. Uh, so these are great Chinese contributions to a greener world. Uh, China is still a developing country, but it's uh, the biggest uh, developing country with a huge production capacity and potential market. Uh, Norway is a small country, but uh, has advanced technologies and highly developed in many ways. How can China and Norway cooperate in mutually beneficial way? Since China is so big and Norway is so small, I think it's useful to focus on the areas where Norway a specific world leading technology. Few areas, uh, Norway is uh, absolutely in the forefront when it comes to uh, offshore wind. Uh, we have a long his history with oil um, drilling at sea, but that cannot be turned into uh, wind, wind farms at sea, which is of course one of the best potential uh, sources of energy in the future. Uh, Norway has a 100 years history of ammonia and green hydrogen. Uh, that can be used in a partnership now to provide green hydrogen for trucks or ferries or shipping or, or aviation. Uh, Norway also has an extremely successful policy to introduce electric cars. We had the last month 80% of all new cars sold in Norway were electric, and we are leading the world on electric ferries, again, due to good policies of the government. So this electrification of ferries and shipping, uh, offshore wind, Green hydrogen are some of the areas where we should work together. Of course, this is not an exclusive list, and this partnership is welcome. But uh, these may be the areas to focus on in a future uh, partnership between China and Norway. Mm. Uh, just now, you mentioned a little bit about Belt, Belt and Road. Huh? As we have discussed, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has put up forward uh, the initiative called Belt and Road and hoping to enlarge cooperation with countries along the road and uh, at the sea. And uh, so in what way do you, you think uh, Norway and China can cooperate? Uh, yeah, maybe it's not uh, limited to infrastructure, maybe trading, telecom telecommunication or satellite for Arctic regions. So what is your vision about this uh, cooperation? Yeah, of course, Belt and Road is the biggest investment uh, scheme in our time. It's 130 nations plus uh, participating. I just looked to the list of Africa. There's a 
two or three or four African nations which are not part participating in Belt and Road, but nearly all are. So it's a huge opportunity uh, for driving green investments in, in all parts of the world. Uh, and Norwegian, Ch Norwegian Chinese business can work together on that. Uh, some of the areas like offshore wind, green hydrogen, electrification of shipping. Norway is also first range nation when it comes to uh, fish farming. We have the, the biggest and most uh, modern fish farming in industry in the world. It's not perfect from an environment point of view, but much, much better than in the past. And always a big shipping nation uh, with some of the greenest and most uh, environmentally conscious uh, shipping uh, magnets anywhere in the world. And they, they really want to take their, their fleet into a green direction. And that would be an obvious area to cooperate with China. Remind yourself that seven out of the 10 biggest ports in the world are in China. All the 10 biggest ports in the world are in East Asia. So if you want shipping to go green, and Norway is big on shipping, both a partnership between Norway and China will be essential. Great. And uh, Norway is advanced in many ways. And uh, historically, China and you know, Norway have been very friendly. For example, Norway built up hospitals for the Chinese before and even after China's liberation. Uh, the hospital still exists and modern. In the uh, new year, how can China and Norway continue to develop their friendly and mutually beneficial relations? Maybe a little bit <laughs> repetitive, but you can elaborate a little more. I think we should also look into people to people relations because at the end it's not just about business and politics, but uh, that people come together. That has been very difficult during COVID. That when COVID is over, hopefully we can see many, many more tourists going in both directions and more people to people contact. I have to say, I'm also worried with their tendency for very negative treatment uh, of China in some Western media. It's completely unfair. Some Western media are just looking for everything negative in China and reporting that. Some of these negatives are true, and some of them are fake news, uh, but it creates a, 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 a distorted image of China. If you look to the Chinese scene, uh, there is nothing negative about Norway, but there tend to be quite a lot of negative news about the United States of America and Chinese social media. And I think also China should try to rein in some of these uh, nationalistic anti-American sentiments uh, among the Chinese people, because we need to respect each other. There are many, many problems in the United States of America, uh, but let's also realize that this is one of the most fascinating and fabulous nations which has ever existed on planet Earth. There is a lot of respect in America also. Okay, and the lastly, um, uh, Norway will uh, participate in Beijing's Winter Olympics and Norway is very strong in winter games, you know. Uh, and uh, so will you say something to the athletes and to Beijing, the host? Yes, of course, I mean, Winter Olympics are very, very big in Norway. Uh, in fact, uh, last time in South Korea, we became the biggest winner of gold medals of any nation. So, of course, while we, are, we have some advantages with so much snow and so cold winters, uh, we are very, very, very proud of what our athletes um, achieved there. So, I wish the athletes uh, will do well in, in Beijing. I hope they will also have some time to see the beauty of Beijing and the Hebei province of China. It's a very beautiful place. Also, enjoy some of the uh, green technologies and uh, green achievements, which you will be able to observe. I mean, the high speed and uh, non <clears throat> high speed rail, the green rail between uh, between between Beijing city center and the, uh, and some of the arenas. And the way it, this is done as one of the most environment friendly Olympic Games uh, ever. And when there are when there are differences in, in opinion, uh, let's use the Olympic as a, as an arena for dialogue between the. Uh, Western, uh, Western culture and the Chinese culture and others. So you support support the <laughs> Beijing Olympics? <laughs> uh, uh, abs absolutely, for sure. Uh, I support the Norwegian athletes uh, uh, attending it and I, I support, uh, support the Olympics. Fortunately, it seems that this uh, diplomatic boycott, which was initiated by the United States, don't get a lot of attraction uh, globally. And for sure, no one wants athletes to, uh, to remain from competing. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And uh, thank you for your timing and the wonderful answers for every questions. And uh, we hope you, to have more have chance to invite you to have more programs in our media. Happy to attend. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.